So my story begins with two boys, Sam and Liam. They're just graduating high school. And I said before, Jack London gets them all hot and bothered about going to Alaska. So they decide they're going to go spend their summer and they're going to go off to, uh, to discover gold. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hi, and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. It's Rick Nusky. Thank you very much for joining us. You are what makes all of the difference to the success of this show. And it's wonderful to know that what we're doing is making a difference for you. Now, I've always had a very soft spot for book authors. And on today's show, I'm with Neil Perry Gordon. Welcome to the show, Neil. Thank you, Rick. Good to be here. It's wonderful to have you here. Now, uh, what I like to do, Neil, at the start of every show is learn a little bit more about my guests because I think it's very important to give some context. Now, for everybody who's wondering, we're going to be talking about, um, I guess, not only the process of uh, creating books and and Neil's journey, but also his latest novel called Hope City. But uh, before we do all that, Neil, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Where should I begin? Oh, look, uh, as early as you can go back. (laughs) I was born in the Bronx, um, which is kind of funny because people always think when they see me, they go, where are you from? You're from Italy or are you from France? And they think I'm from European country. And I go, no, I'm from the Bronx. uh, (laughs) It just gives me a kick to say that. I'm cultured Um, in a different way. Yeah. It's like, like, (laughs) what? The Bronx? I go, yeah, the Bronx, home of the Yankees. So... (laughs) That's where I was born. And then I uh, moved my parents. Actually, it's interesting because the last, the, the, we have, right now we're having a, uh, a mass exodus of people living in New York City out to the suburbs once again. Mm-hmm. Um, this happened back in the 60s when, the, you know, people were having a mass exodus in the suburbs first were getting populated. Um, that's when my parents moved out of the Bronx and moved, moved up to uh, Rothman County, which is a suburb of Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was seven years old, I went from being in the Bronx to being in the country. And it was like, you know, I always describe it as that moment, like when Dorothy opens up that door and when the, when the house crashes in Oz and it goes from black and white to color. <laughs> you know, that was like my experience going from living in the Bronx to living in the country. You know, it was, uh, it was that type of experience. Um, and then I went to a school, uh, sort of accidentally, you know, serendipitously, which was down the street, uh, a Waldorf school uh, called Green Meadow Waldorf School, which is a, they have schools all over the world, um, started by uh, philosopher uh, Rudolf Steiner in Austria. And uh, he created a very unique school. He called it the Wal- it was a Waldorf school. Um, and uh, now there's all over the world, there are schools like that. And it focuses on teaching children um, through creativity, um, you know, through the arts, mm-hmm. through drama, through, through all that. And that's why I have a love for that today because of that exposure, having it as a, you know, so young. Um, at the same time though, I also grew up in my parents' business in their store. So my parents, my father, my grandfather had retail businesses in the Bronx, houseware and hardware stores. And then they moved it up to the suburbs when we moved up. And so I had two lives. I had a life going to the Green Meadow Waldorf school. And then I had a life in business world, working in my parents' store my whole life. Um, Talk about contrast. Yeah. I mean, I had like, uh, once I found like um, a diary of mine from some time in my life when I was a kid, and it was like, either I was at school or I was at the store. I was, that was it. Um, that, that was my life. So it was unique though, too. Also, my father was always a big uh, employer of all my friends. So he had a big retail store in town. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so all my friends worked there at some point in their life as, as teenagers. So that was always a fun thing to have that connection with the, you know, your school friends and, and work. Um, and that school, so that school has really gave me a foundation and also the living and growing up in a business in a retail business too, also built who I was, uh, who I am today. Um, and then uh, I spent a, a good portion of my life, 10 years of my life in Florida in um, Palm Beach area. Wonderful. Where, uh, we opened a store. I went down there, opened, tried to open a store with my parents. I actually met my wife down there um, in Florida. I had my first son, Sam. Uh, he was born in, in, uh, down in that area. Uh, and then moved back up here. Had another, another son, Max. 
So I have two boys. Uh, Max is living on a farm up in Vermont, a biodynamic farm, which is a certain type of way uh, you, you farm. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, it's a, it's a Rudolf Steiner based type farming uh, philosophy. Very interesting. So he's up in Vermont, very safe. He got out of here just in time because he's a hugger. He uh, would be running in town without his mask on, hugging everybody. And I'd be <laughs> like, Max, what please, I like, stop. <laughs> And, you know, then we have all these conspiracy theorists, too, in this community as well. You know, and all, you know, of course, everyone's an anti-vaxxer. Um, yeah, it's alive know, and well, that, isn't it? In that, you know, in that liberal, you know, super liberal New York type of community. And uh, so now the anti-vaxxers all of a sudden have a, all these things in common with the Trumpsters, you know. So it's like this, everything in the world is becoming com discombobulated. Like, where this is not the way things are supposed to be. No, it's you know, like a parallel all, world, but, isn't it? sides have been shifting like you had like you had the battle line and and now the battle line is like a squiggly line and you have like people pushed in all different directions you don't know you don't know whose side you're on anymore <laughs> organized you know? chaos it's exactly now neil i really appreciate your feedback i i, I want to unwrap your life a little bit and, and learn a little bit more about that before we move into the genesis of your writing um you talked about the Yankees a little earlier. Is uh, is sport something that you follow? Do you have any connections still back there? Oh yeah, I'm a big sports fan. You know, as a kid, I you know, <clears throat> as a New Yorker, number one. So, you know, there's certain teams in, in New York. You usually have two teams per sport, and you pick one. You can't have you can't be a Yankee fan and a Met fan. <laughs> you pick one. It's, it's not allowed to be both. <laughs> so that's very strict. Uh, and in basketball, you're a Nick fan or a Net fan. So I'm a Yankee fan. I'm a Nick fan. When it comes to football, we have the Jets and the Giants. Now, I happen to like both. And this is a big faux pas in my house. And my son's <laughs> like, you can't like both. I have a connection to Joe Namath as a kid, so I can't help but having that little place in my heart for the Jets. Wonderful. I, I, thank you very much for you know opening the door to your life, as it, as it were, thus far. I am... Um, I actually did notice through uh, your website one of the credos that you that you look to Jack London's credo in yeah. fact where he talks about and it's got you sitting there on this wonderful backdrop and you're talking about I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them I shall use my time how important is that to you today you know I didn't discover Jack London until I started to write my book Hope City you know of course I knew about him but I didn't research him mm -hmm. now I'm like head over heels over him it's like you know his his life his story the, just the you know you're searching for quotes if you ever search for quotes you could read five pages of quotes by jack london and everyone just blows you away mm. guy was like an amazing guy so he's included in my story uh, he, he begins the story of hope city and he concludes it um he begins it because when the, these two boys um my to my to my main character of the story 17 year old boys in san francisco in in 1898 the graduating high school and the commencement speaker is jack london so jack london gives a stirring speech about not wasting your life and you know when life is over it's like smacking killing a mosquito boom it's dead so he has like this thick you know go out go for the gusto live life to the fullest and these boys are like yeah and off they go to alaska for the summer so uh yeah jack london has a lot that and the fact that picture you're referring to is a picture of me in alaska um, that's beautiful on, and it's on um it's on one of the rivers uh in my book uh i'm in hope alaska in that photo and my story is called hope city it's uh it, it's it always fascinates me neil um i guess the that that moment in time where you decide or uh, that you're going to be an author what was that moment, you know, going back to the first book that you ever wrote? And we will spin back to, to uh, your latest book, Hope City, in a moment. Where did it come from? Where did this inspiration to start writing come from for you? You know, it's like an ember I've carried around all my life. You know, it's, it's just, you know, just sitting there, just, you know, it's like... Smoldering. Uh, smoldering way. And it's like, you know, you, you think about the cavemen who would like invent fire, then they would they would carry that ember with them wherever they went, and God forbid it would ever go out. You know, so I've I've carried that with me. Uh, thank God it never went out. Um, that desire to write. I've I've done writing before uh, my first book, which came out in 2018. I did work, you know, for work for business type mm -hmm. of writing. I wrote for magazines for several years and 
So I non-fictional bus- based. Yeah, yeah, non-fiction. And mm-hmm. I wrote two business books, one on coaching, and I bought one off to architects. And um, they're mostly all for marketing purposes to, you know, for to increase business and reputation. You know, yeah, all that credibility. Mm-hmm. So that was the type of writing I did. But I never did it purely for creative sake. You know, so now I write just to be creative. I write, I don't write for a market. Um, I just write what I like to write about, which is, I mean, total freedom as an artist to do that. I mean, that's what's so wonderful. I'm in the drapery business. My regular business is, a, um, my 30 years of business is draperies. Mm-hmm. And that's a creative business. I'm in interior design. I'm creating beautiful window coverings. I do upholstery. I work with fabrics. But it's not the freedom that you have as an artist as you do as a writer because I'm working for someone else who has a specific vision of what they want. They want a certain, want a certain way. Um, I mean, I get critiqued either way. Yeah, um, constrained I, for, um, constrained uh, creativity. Yeah, right. So it's commissioned work, mm-hmm. so to speak. Um, but it's fine. pays the bills. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've loved doing it, but I love writing a million times more. I can imagine. You know, this uh, when you come up with something... Um, if you look at a, I guess, a business book as you have experience with, and I think that's great for today's call because it gives you a context and you, you say to yourself, uh, fiction versus nonfiction, there's a lot of, um, I guess, rules, grammar, punctuation, uh, you know, focus, outcomes, and all this sort of stuff that you would normally see with a, a nonfiction book. Um, do the gloves come off with nonfiction? You know, it's interesting you said that. I, I read a book by Saul Stein. He's one of the best book, uh, books I've ever read about writing. Mm-hmm. And he talks, and he'll, he'll alternate chapters from nonfiction chapter writers to fiction, go back and forth. And he, and he kept saying, but this applies to both. But this applies to both. You know, the evolution of nonfiction now, if you if you pick up some nonfiction books, I mean, I write, I've got just Tombstone, the new one, uh, nonfiction, but it, but it reads as, a, as fiction, you know. The way writers write today, um, unless it's a technical journal, of course. Yeah. Uh, but you're writing about the, the nonfiction story of Tombstone with Wyatt Earp, but you're writing it based on real historical facts. You're not, you know, dripping in fiction with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you still can write it in a way that sounds like a fiction writer, you know. So, um, you know, rules. Uh, you know, everyone follows rules. Or, and, and wants to keep a structure because you're still communicating to, to other people. That's the, so the purpose of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as long as you can make that connection with people uh, in terms of I'm telling you a story and you understand the story that I'm telling you. Because if you don't, I mean, then no one's going to want to read your stuff. Do you find that your book has to be a certain length? Is it is it something that you can just ramble on and just keep going because it is your your personal passion to just write for the creative process and which i think is important for the my future business audience because there are a lot of book authors that are going through this process right now do you have to i guess uh, put some sort of boundaries on how long a book should be in this regard well all my books are exactly uh, eighty thousand words so they're all eighty thousand. i work within that structure it just you know in terms of uh, my story you know connecting all the dots mm-hmm. making sure I have, you know, different acts, different scenes. Um, it all works out to about 80,000 words. And what I also do is all my chapters are short, short, short. So like three, four, five pages. If I have a six page chapter, that's like, that's the longest chapter you're going to see in the book. So I'll have like 90 chapters or 95 chapters in a book. And uh, yeah. I was, someone just wrote a review and it gave me a really good review. What he says, there's 90, I saw there's 92 chapters in the book. This was for the bomb squad. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, I, and so he like, didn't know what, whether he should critique that or not. But then he read the book and he was like, yeah, but it works because I had to, I had to tell you, Rick, everybody comments to me that they love the short chapters. People just love reading just from a mechanical point of view of just sitting down and reading a book. Short chapters work for most people because they don't feel like, okay, I'm just going to read a chapter and then if I fall asleep or whatever, I'll, you know, whatever it is, I could just stop and I have a place I can make a, a good place in the book and I'm going to forget where I'm at because people don't want to stop in the middle of a chapter. And if it's, you know, your chapters are 20 pages long, <laughs> yeah, they're like, it's oh my a, God. It's I'm been never a journey. Gonna... Yeah. So, uh, and I never did that on purpose. That was purely accidental that I was writing that way. And um, I, that, that's become my style. Now, of course, I'm encouraged to do that. So, you know, when I get to my third page, I'm going, okay, it's time to wrap this, this chapter, this scene up. 
um, you know, unless, uh, unless it does, less is so much more to say, then of course I won't stop, but you know, so three, four, five pages is basically my chapter size. Yeah, thank you again. Um, it's great to uh, nuggets of information here for other aspiring book authors to look to, Neil. I, I wonder, um, is it, a, is it a long journey for you to write a book or is it something that you know that's just sitting there and you, you can knock it out in a couple of days? Well, okay, so I just finished a manuscript today um, and it's going to my editor. So, and I just looked when I began the manuscript and what it tells you when you first opened it. So it was December 15th, 2019. And we're basically now, oh yeah, it's almost May 17th. So it's five months. Um, uh, January, February, March, April, May. Yeah, five months. Uh, five months. I did the, the the manuscript. She won't be able to take it and work on it till sometime in June, and then she needs a, about a month working with me over it. She, we do developmental edits. She'll say, you know, certain things like you need to develop this, you know, this love relationship a little bit better, um, or you know, this is not believable. You know, she'll give me her her overview. And that's really helpful. She's done now five books of mine. Um, mm -hmm. So she knows. Me. I mean, and, and you know, there's no greater conversation I have than when she, when I give her a new book and then, well, the first time I did it was nervous wreck. So when I give it, when I give the book, she'll read it first and then, and then we'll have a conversation about it. So that, that first book I sent her, I did Cabo's tale and she, I was waiting for that call. Like, I don't know if I could write or not. I mean, this was it. This was the test. This was the moment that was going to decide and i loved doing it and i was like i've got to hope she's going to like this book i hope i can write i hope i have the ability to do this so the call came and i was rec back then i was recording it of course for posterity um and I, actually i got to find where those calls are because <laughs> I don't, the posterity might have been erased uh but anyway i'll never forget, I'll never forget what she said to me she said you are a writer this, she gave me a lot of compliments about the first book. Of course, I needed a ton of work. I had all my points of view were all off. I, I you know, it was basic mechanics I needed to learn, but I learned. I learned the, you know, the show don't tell stuff, which is always big um, in any book. And I, I learned how to evoke feelings into my into my writing. I learned how to, you know, develop my dialogue better and, you know, work on relationship building. You know, it's so many things that you have to work on. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it takes a while. And then once we're done with the editing, it's got to be proofread. And then that's that's a couple of months, one or two passes of proofreading. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, even after all that, there's still mistakes in the book. You yeah. know, and like people tell me that. You know, my mother tells me that. <laughs> I I send my book to my mother, and she reads my book, and I'm like. Okay, mom, tell me what you think. She goes, okay, I found five mistakes. Oh. I thought, mom, no, I don't <laughs> care about the mistakes. I want to know what you thought about the book. Just take she, yourself on a journey, mom. She says, no, no, don't you want to know? I'm like, you know, but then I was thinking, you know, but that's how she always, yeah. with my homework, you would correct my homework always, you know. Uh -huh. was, so it's, this is, she thought this was her job to tell me uh, what was the mistakes. I was uh -huh. like, it's kind of late, you know, the, the book's printed, you know, it's, it's a little late now. You need to proofread it. So anyway, so the proofreading takes a process. Then it's got to be uploaded. And so from start to finish, it probably, you know, six, seven months from the time I put pen to paper or stroke that first key on my laptop mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. like I'm holding the book in my hand. It's probably about seven months. Thank you. I, um, I wonder, what are your sources of inspiration? Are they current day events that are going on? Are they historical events? I know that you've got some World War One uh, era books. So, in terms of today and what's happening around us, would that inspire some of your future work? Do you think? Yeah, I haven't delved into current work, current times. Mm -hmm. uh, everything I've used so far has been historical fiction, or um, the Righteous One wasn't historical fiction, but it took place in 1960. Um, you know, I look for, I, I really seek more story and character and, and then I'll look for a place maybe to put it in. What's good about historical fiction is that I could use events at the time as backdrop, as color, as conflict, um, and have, you know, a good journey for my characters to, to go through. Um, when I did uh, Moonflower, that was written at the 1670s, and I wanted to write a tale about a young man and his journey 
looking for the great spirit, a, a Dutch boy going on a, a, a journey to find the great spirit through an indigenous tribe in the Northeast in the 1670s. So uh, there I was, I wanted to write about the time. You know, my son was actually in school at the time getting his degree in um, his, actually was getting a minor in indigenous studies. So he had, he, he, I had a lot of access to information through him about what the indigenous life was like in the Northeast. Um, he had professors, I sat in on classes, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, the guy made beaver stew. Beaver and stew. I was there, yeah, beaver wow. stew, it's indigenous. It sounds awful. <laughs> You know, but it was good. I mean, it's like pot roast. It was, yeah. and, and I got with all the students and we tasted it. It was like, yeah, how cool is this? So I wrote it because this was like the beaver trade back in the 1670s in the Northeast was, was like amazing. Everyone, you know, we're catching all these beavers. The indigenous people were, were catching, the, catching the beavers, trading them to the, uh, to the Dutch who were then bringing them back to Amsterdam. And they were making hats out of these, out of the furs and the beaver hats. And they mm-hmm. were like the most popular thing. Um, it was, it was, a you know, they couldn't get enough. They like basically uh, hunted out all the beaver after a while. It was just so popular, these hats. So that was part of that time. So I researched the beaver industry, the beaver hat business, which was fun to learn about. Um, and the story, the story about Moonflag, it just give you a little quick synopsis of how it begins. Um, there's this boy, he's, he's Lucas Peterson. He's my protagonist. So he's going to go and search for the great spirit and uh, in order to do this, he has to consume the moonflower, uh, the seeds from the moonflower, which is a flower that only blooms at night, under the auspices and guidance of a shaman. And the purpose of taking this moonflower is to have this rites of passage so he can go out on his journey for the great spirit. But what will happen is he will lose his memory. Everything he knows, he's 17 years old, everything he knows up to that point will be erased. He'll have an empty mind so he can go out on this journey clean and pure and searching for the great spirit. So the book begins when the shaman says to him, you, he gives him a quill and, and parchment and says, write everything down of your life that you remember up to this point, from your earliest memory to this morning. And this will be your document you have in case, just in case your memory does not come back. Otherwise, you'll never, you're not gonna know who you are. So he writes everything down. Of course, when he takes the, the moonflower the next day, he has this document in front of him, but. It's just words on the page. There's no emotional connection to his life anymore, to all these things. So, mm-hmm. so he, so this journey is going back and rediscovering who he is, and he has this whole this whole epic tale that brings him through these these tribes and also battles English soldiers here at that time, um, who just are basically now driving out the Dutch from this area. Uh, and of course, we have some evil characters that he has to deal with. Uh, and the uh, epic journey to Amsterdam and down to the slave coast of Africa, of course, across to the slave market in Charlestown, South Carolina, as it was called back then, and then uh, back up through Philadelphia and then up into New York and the Northeast and New England again. So that's Moonflower. It's a, it's, um, it's a fun tale of the 1670s. Uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing. You've drawn a picture in my mind's eye about what this book is in a matter of a minute, less than a minute. It's, um, it's a fascinating skill to have to be able to do that. And uh, you, I guess you as a, a young author, when you first started this part of your life's journey, wondering whether or not you can write, it's clear to me that you can if you can just, you know, uh, express what the story is like that. So thank you very much. Now, I wonder, um, do you have anybody that you look to, other authors, um, to guide you, is there anybody that you like to follow? There's lots, you know. Uh, you know, I just got involved with Masterclass. Have you heard of Masterclass? I've not. This is um, it's, it's done very well. Is the is these videos and and classes done by the most famous people who are doing them, and, and you know, famous actors and famous writers and whatever whatever genre you want to learn something in, they have the top, top, top people. Mm-hmm. So uh, in writing, there's some of the best. There's Dan Brown, who wrote The Da Vinci Code, um, James Patterson, best-selling writer, uh, Neil Gaiman, wonderful writer, um, uh, David Mamet. I mean, the, all the top writers and screenplay writers, and they, they do like 12 to 14 hours of, of teaching, of just talking. I don't li- I don't watch it. I, I usually I listen to them while I run mm-hmm. during the day. Go out for a run and listen to them. Uh, go over things, and it's such a wonderful opportunity to hear from the best of the best on their how they do the craft of writing. 
Um, and it speaks to me so clearly because I'm doing exactly what they're doing. Um, of course, I don't have the same result that they have, but I'm doing, I do think the way they do things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very encouraging to hear, I think some authors write, like James Patterson does very detailed outlines. Um, he'll have a hundred page outline. So when he starts a story, he knows exactly what he's going to do next. It's all spelled out for him. He's got to connect the dots. Whereas someone like um, David Baldacci or, or Neil Gordon, <laughs> huh. Neil Perry Gordon, writes it uh, organically and has no outline. Stephen King does it the same way. Um, comes up with an idea and just writes and, and lets the writing just take him wherever it takes him. Um, that's how I do it. Um, that's um, that's how your I modus operandi. It. Yeah, I really love it doing that way because I don't know where I'm, I'm, I'm going to, how I'm going to get there. I know where I want to end up. I know where I'm beginning. I know where I want to end up. I just know, don't know how I'm going to get there. <laughs> and that's usually usually the case, isn't it? I, I wonder if we can shift gears and talk about Hope City. Could you give us an outline of, of this wonderful book? I go to Alaska every year for the past 12 years. And my friends live in Anchorage, and they have a, they have a cabin uh, in a little town, old mining town called Hope which is about two hours outside of Anchorage. And the most exciting thing about going to see them is we get to the, we get to Anchorage, we land at the airport and, we'll, and he, they already have the car packed and we're going right to Hope. And I've been going to stop at the house in Anchorage. I'm like, yes, hmm. you know, off we go. And, and there was two towns, two cities along what's called Turnigan Arm. Um, Turnigan Arm is an inlet right off Cook Inlet. And uh, when Captain James Cook discovered this part of Alaska, he was looking for the Northwest Passage. So he came up to Cook Inlet. He sent someone down on a boat down this, this other inlet and see if there was a way out, but he had to turn back again. So that's why they called this particular inlet Turnigan. So it's called Turnigan Arm. That's how it got its name. And Hope is there alongside Sunrise. Sunrise City was the big city back in 1898, a, a gold mining city. Mm -hmm. it's no longer exists. It's 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 gone now. All it is is, is you know just woods and some old cemetery plots. But hope still exists. Um, and the and the um, the story of how hope got named is how my book begins. So hope at the time was unnamed city. Um, Sunrise had a name. There was eight thousand people were living there in 1898. It was the most populated city in all of Alaska. These were all the people who didn't go to the Klondike who wanted to go someplace that was easier to find the gold because getting to the Klondike was an outrageous type of expedition to go. You had to climb what was called the Golden Steps, which was this mountainous climb. And every person, according to the Canadian government, must bring 2,000 pounds of supplies because they were afraid that living a winter out in Dawson City, <laughs> in the, up in the uh, frigid cold mm -hmm. in the Arctic, you're going to die. You're not going to have enough supplies. So you can't carry 2,000 pounds over on your back in one trip. So you had to take this trip over and over again until you, until you got your supplies over. And then you had to take a raft or build a raft and take it down the rapids, down the Yukon, until you get to the Klondike where Dawson City was. So, you know, it was a journey to get there. But 30,000 people were in Dawson City in 1897, 1898. But some people went to Hope and some people went to Sunrise. So there was a little bit of a gold rush there as well. And you can look at uh, videos of geological reasons why there was gold in, the, in that particular area. Mm -hmm. uh, so my story begins uh, with two boys, um, Sam Rothman and, uh, and Liam Campen. Sam and Liam, they're high school boys. They're just graduating high school. And I said before, Jack London does the commencement, gets them all hot and bothered about going to Alaska. So they decide they're going to go spend their summer gra after graduating uh, high school. They talk to parents. It's allowing them to go. And they're going to go off to uh, to discover gold. So Sam Rothman is a Jewish boy in San Francisco, and is and just about as about to leave on the ship. Sam's father Benjamin comes up to him and says, "You know, Sam, there's a lot of ruffians up there, and you know, probably not a good idea for a boy named Sam Rothman to go up there. Maybe you should change your name. So it's less conspicuous. You blend a little bit. You know, have a name like Percy or something. You know, some sort of Midwestern type common name. You know, like." And they go, okay, I'll be Percy. And the mother goes, well, what about a last name? And thinking about it, she says, I like the word hope. Why don't you be Percy Hope? So that's his alias, Samuel Rothman, AKA Percy Hope. So off he goes. Meanwhile, so they're sailing up 
through the Gulf of Alaska, going up to Cook Inlet on the on a steamship, the Bertha. Meanwhile, uh, at the place where the unnamed town of soon to be named town of Hope is standing, is one of my evil, most evil character. His name is Magnus Vega, and he's standing there uh, with his cohort, and he's saying, "We need to name this town once and for all already. It's long enough to have this, you know, to be unnamed. We have Sunrise, and we have Hope." And I mean, I'm sorry, we have sunrise, we have this town that has no name. Mm -hmm. So he says, the next person who steps off that ship and places his foot right on land in front of us, we're going to ask his name or whatever his name is, that's what we're going to name our city. And of course, who is it? It's Percy, Percy Hope. Hope. And, and that is how we, uh, we get the name of Hope. And it's called, the name of the book is called Hope City. It's a trip down the rabbit hole for Percy Hope. I mean, all sorts of weird things happen during his summer the summertime up there, looking for gold. He runs into all sorts of characters um, that are just, you know, will blow your mind. And uh, it's a tale. It's the Alaskan Adventures of Percy Hope, book one. And um, there, there will be a book two, actually, as well. So you're underway with the, the second book? I am just underway. I mean, this scratching the surface, doing my research. It's going to be about Nome, Alaska in the year 1900, which was a wonderful time um, in terms of story. Uh, Wyatt Earp uh, had a saloon in, in Nome, Alaska in 1900 called the Dexter. So Wyatt Earp from Tombstone fame, OK Corral fame, will be a character in this new novel, um, as well as some of my characters from Hope City that will be also making a second appearance. I love the uh, the villainous saloon owner, the name Magnus Vega. What a great name. Now, you've done it again, um, Neil. You've painted a picture in less than uh, 60 seconds about this wonderful book. There's a book two on its way now. Um, more importantly, where can people find all of your wonderful work, especially Hope City, if they want to buy it? Well, you can go on to Amazon. Um, you, if you look under Neil Perry Gordon, you'll see my books there. Hope City won't be up there till June 20th on mm -hmm. the uh, summer solstice. So uh, it'll be June 20th, 2020. Summer solstice will be a release of Hope City. Um, if any of your readers want to read the book ahead of time and give me a review, I can give advanced reader copies for free if they send me, send me uh, their email address to neilperrygordon at gmail.com. And I'll send you a free PDF of the book all I ask is read it. Hopefully you'll love it. And hopefully you'll give me five stars on Amazon, which, um, you know, as a book, I'm a book writer. I also have to be a bookseller and I have to, um, have to keep promoting, getting, asking people for reviews. That's what sells books when you have good reviews. You've been a, a wonderful guest. Some of the insights that you've shared for those who are aspiring to become authors is all on this call today. For those uh, listeners who are wanting to become a book author, you must reach out to Neil Perry Gordon at neilperrygordon.com. Now I will be making the links, uh, clickable links back to Neil and all of his wonderful work, as well as the Amazon links. And with that, Neil, thank you so very much for spending some time with me on the My Future Business Show today. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends, and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.